so wonderful is your unfailing love. Your cross has spoken mercy over me. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no heart could fully know. How glorious, how beautiful you are. Beautiful one I love, beautiful one I adore, beautiful one my soul must sing. Powerful, so powerful, your glory fills the sky. Your mighty works displayed for all to see. The beauty of your majesty awakes my heart to sing. How marvelous, how wonderful you are. Beautiful one I love, beautiful one I adore, beautiful one my soul. captured my heart with this love cause nothing on earth is as beautiful as you you opened my eyes to your wonders anew you captured my heart with this love cause nothing on earth is as beautiful as you beautiful my heart with this love cause nothing on earth is as beautiful as you I 
Good morning. Welcome to Simple Truth Church. This is still really strange, but it's nice to be able to get together with you, and I'm glad you're here this morning. Hope you're all getting vitamin D and sheltering in place, and I have noticed, though, that there's a lot more traffic on the street when I was heading down here, so there's people that are getting tired of being sheltered in place, I guess, and the numbers are still down low in Nevada County, and so they're venturing out, <clears throat> but I hope everybody's safe and doing well. You know, the God of all grace, as the Bible says, is pouring out His grace upon us, and I'm praying that for you, that He'll continue to pour His grace out upon you and, and upon this world, upon the United States of America. And uh, it's always good, like I said, to be here with you this morning this way, but I'm looking forward to getting together with you at church, hopefully soon. So anyway, I have uh, a few announcements for you. One is... Just go to simpletruthlive.com. You can check out things there. And my phone number's on there. It's the church phone number. So if you call the church, that's my cell phone. If you need anything, if you want to talk, then uh, do that. You can text me and we'll get right back to you and, and see if we can help you out. And then uh, as far as prayer requests go, we will remember those that are sick among us. And most of you know that list by heart. And then we have our own lists, our own spoken lists. And then also, we want to uh, remember our military members, those in the armed forces, and we'll lift them up in prayer as well and their families. Pray that God will pour His grace out upon them and strengthen them and keep them safe. And then also, uh, you can pray for, for me this afternoon after church. I'm going to go over to uh, Ken and Barbara Higgins' home where we're going to have a... a uh, memorial service for their little girl who passed away last week. She's, she was a little girl, but she was 21. Her name was Michelle Rose, and she was special. She had a lot of special needs, and, and Jesus took care of all those special needs for a lot more years on this side of heaven than people expected her to be. And so she went home to be with Jesus, and so this afternoon we'll have a little 10 or less memorial service for her. And so let's pray and then we'll get into the Word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this absolutely gorgeous Sunday morning that we can get together and spend time with you. And so Lord, before we start, we just want to lift those that are sick among us and just ask you in the name of Jesus to touch them. Lord, that you would strengthen them. Lord, that you would comfort them, that you would give them peace. Lord, I pray for our armed forces, and especially those that we know that are connected to Simple Truth Church, that you would bless them and keep them well, keep them safe, keep them out of harm's way. Bless their families also for the sacrifices they make. Lord, I'd also like to lift up our first responders. Pray the, the same for them, that you keep them safe, keep them well. And so, Lord, I just pray as, as we open your word this morning that you would teach us. Lord, that Jesus would come off the pages of the scripture that we spend time together Lord, that you would open the eyes of our heart, the open, open the eyes of our understanding this morning as we spend time with Paul the Apostle. And so we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we're going through this, remember we started the uh, overview last week of Ephesians 6, 6.10, and the whole armor of God. And there's things that we talked about, and some of them I'll cover again today, just as like a... Uh, a rehashing, but, but I was thinking about how this is, there's always balance. There's always balance in the word. So, so when I'm talking about the spiritual warfare, I'm not talking about like Flip Wilson, you know, the, the devil made me do it. I'm not going to talk about that everything that ever happens to us is the, Satan's fault or that we can blame everything on Satan. I mean, I wish I could blame a lot of things in my life on Satan, but it's like my dad had told me all of my life that life is choices and, and we make choices. And so I've, I've made a lot of not so good choices. And so I, I'm not going to blame that on Satan. But there's a lot of things that we're under attack of by, by spiritual forces, by, by a spiritual enemy, that there is warfare going on. There's warfare going on around us that we don't see. And so Paul the Apostle, he touches on that in Ephesians chapter 2. But then he comes down and then he's going to give us the how-to. 
in, in where we are now in Ephesians chapter 6. And so if you follow along with me, you have your Bibles, you have your iPhones or your whatever, you got the Bible right there. I know Sound Dude Larry's probably going to put it on the screen and make it easy for you, but uh, you can follow along with me. Okay, Ephesians 6, 6 uh, verses 10 through 13. And it says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand or be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle with against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. You know, last week, when we had our overview, we saw that this passage of scriptures, it, it, it answers the question that leaders have today, that leaders have always had. If they're, if they're not asking the question, they, they sure are pondering the question. And that's why can't we solve the basic problems of human life? You know, why can't we understand ourselves? Why is it that, that we're so totally helpless and powerless to change human nature? You know, why is it that each generation has to fight the same battles that are fought by the previous ones over and over again? Why is it that history repeats itself and bad history repeats itself? You know, Paul's answer to these questions is, is uh, he goes behind society's frustration and anger, you know, the, 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 what's visible to the world and, and what we read about in the news. He goes behind that and he says in verse 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And, and so that would be also known as the kingdom of evil. And, and just a little side note here about spiritual forces where he says against spiritual forces of evil. You know, we say the Holy Spirit, okay? Thereby recognizing that there is an unholy spirit as well. And so there's, we distinguish between the two. We recognize the existence of, of Holy Spirit or of unholy spirits just by saying Holy Spirits. And so we mentioned, you know, some of the reactions of this uh, view of life uh, last week. And we know there's some who are ready to reject this. They reject this as ridiculousness. It's like you're stupid. They refuse to believe that there's any unseen powers, whether it's good or bad, whether it's God or devil. They reject the whole, whole idea of any spiritual kingdom. And of course, anyone that, that uh, well, has that right, everybody has the freedom to say, well, speak whatever they want to speak and make that decision. But when they do, they reject the testimony of, of the Bible. They reject the testimony of the Bible as, as the authority in these areas and the testimony of millions of Christians, millions of Christians through the centuries. And they also reject the intelligent conclusions that many people who are not even Christians, you know, all of whom recognize the existence of a spiritual kingdom such as this that we're talking about this morning. You know, anyone who chooses to take that position does so without any kind of intelligent information or evidence to support them. And so they must ultimately face the fact that they have no answer for the confusion and for the problems of life. They have nothing uh, to, with which they can explain the questions which constantly come before us and before the world on a daily basis. You know, the only good explanation for the human dilemma ever put forth is done so by these words from the Apostle Paul. But, but think about this. The usual methods of, of human reform are almost always legislation, education, and an improved environment to, to change the environment. You know, every problem we face in society is usually addressed by using one or, or all three or a combination of those three. You know, legislation is, is law, okay, that uh, it's just going to control the outward person. And we already know, we can't legislate sanity. We can't legislate immorality. And we can't legislate 
people's hearts. It, that doesn't happen. You know, that just controls the outward person. It has nothing to do with it. It can't do anything with the inward person. And it doesn't change the basic nature of humanity at all. But it just restricts people so that they don't demonstrate certain actions under given conditions or, or conditions that come up and, and especially don't demonstrate evil actions when conditions come up. In education, it doesn't basically change the inner person either. You know, it makes them more creative, okay? The Bible says in Jeremiah 17, verses 9 and 10, it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick or desperately wicked. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. You know, some of us are just more deceitful than others. You know, and to educate a deceitful mind, it just makes it, it, it more creative in deceitfulness. For example, an educated criminal, you know, is far more creative and it's a lot more difficult to catch that criminal in the act. And, and so again, education, it doesn't change people's basic nature. It makes people more creative. And then improved environment, it doesn't, it doesn't change people either. We, it's been tried and tested over and over again that a person, you can take a person out of a, a bad environment and you place them into a, a better environment or a nicer environment and absolutely nothing happens to that person themselves. Given time, given a little time, time will tell, they will infect the new environment. And, and there's, uh, those, are usually, those are usually the approaches for reform. And so they all have certain qualities. You don't want to throw them all out. They have certain qualities and, and, and values as tools, but they, they don't come to grips with the basic underlying problem. Okay, humanity falls in despair when, when, uh, when they're far from God. When they're separated from God, humanity falls into despair. You know, th there's this growing sense of despair everywhere we turn today. It is, is unconscious realization of humanity's helplessness from the attack of Satan. And, and, if, and if Paul's declaration is true, and it is true, then it's absolutely futile to attempt to correct the world's problems without dealing with this evil power that's behind them. And so these principalities and powers that, that are unseen that Paul speaks of. Yet our leaders, they proudly pat themselves on the back and they say, hey, you know what? We've solved this problem. We know how we got this dialed in. We got it. It's all under control. But they, they only move to a different symptom of the same disease. And we can't be of any possible help to the solutions of the problem as long as we remain parts of the problem. Because as we're going to see, Paul the Apostle, he's going to tell us, Hey, you guys that are redeemed, you guys that are following Jesus, you used to be part of the problem. But because of that, this whole passage is designed to call our attention to the need for understanding of the nature of our problem. And so we've already seen that the devil attacks humanity, and it attacks humanity in two ways, directly and indirectly. The direct attack involves the obvious and outright control of a human personality. Though that's the most dramatic, it's the least dangerous in the forms that the devil uses, you know, because there doesn't seem to be a lot of demon-possessed people in the world, though there are some. I remember it was probably 1992. I was up uh, by Lake Tahoe, and, and, and Pastor Ken Duncan and I were ministering in a, in a jail there, and there was a, a group of guys that were incarcerated there, and they were on a work detail, and they were in this cove right there by Garwood's steakhouse there in between Garwoods and Sierra Boat Company. And it was winter and there was snow. I don't know. There was probably snow a foot deep. And then there was just around the edges of that, there was ice. And one of the guys in the work crew, he's a big guy and he's wearing a big jacket. He's, you know, it's like I said, it's winter and he's got this big jacket on. And all of a sudden he starts screaming, I will save you. I will save you. And he runs, breaks the ice and he runs and he dives into Lake Tahoe. Well, he gets fished out of Lake Tahoe. He's, you know, he's going to have hyperthermia. He gets fished out of there. And, and, and so Pastor Ken and I were talking to him. We said, hey, man, what were you doing? And he says, didn't you hear those voices? There was voices, lots of voices, and they were screaming, 
save us, save us. I said, what, what were you saving them from? He goes, they were the lost souls. You didn't hear the lost souls? And we said, no, no, we didn't hear the lost souls. We didn't hear anything. And so we started talking to him and, and uh, he said, do you hear that lady that's talking to me? No. Well, she's screaming at me right now and you don't hear her? No, we don't hear her. We don't hear anything. And what is she screaming? Well, she's screaming that you're liars, that you're liars. You're talking to me about Jesus and you're sharing Jesus with me. She's screaming, you're liars. And I said, well, who, who does she think Jesus is? And he says, she thinks she, she's Jesus. She said, she's Jesus. And so I was a rookie and Pastor Ken, he goes through the whole realize, recognize, repent, receive. And he talks to, to this guy and this guy ends up accepting Jesus. Okay, when he accepts Jesus and he makes that confession, he says, yeah, that's what I believe. And do you want to follow Jesus? And he confesses with his mouth that, he, that he's going to be a follower of Jesus. He starts screaming like a woman. I mean, a straight up woman's voice screaming, no, no, liars, liars. And then his, I mean, it was almost like we were watching The Exorcist. His, the, his eyes rolled in the back of his head. He's screaming this, sounds just like a woman. And then when he kind of like comes to, he's like, I don't hear her anymore. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I don't hear her anymore. And so we start talking to him, and apparently she'd been with him for five years. He was doing methamphetamine. He was doing methamphetamine where he'd stay up for five days, do five-day runs, where he started seeing purple people in the trees, where he started opening, he opened up his mind to the occult and to, and to the, the spiritual darkness. And so he, and let, he let her in five years before. And so during that, now she's been inside of him, and she's been harassing him for five years. He doesn't get sleep. All he does is hear her screaming. And so he kept thanking us while he's telling us the story. And so afterwards, I was talking to Ken, and I said, man, don't you think we should have cast that demon out of that guy? And he says, why? Because that demon co can't cohabit with someone who's saved because the Holy Spirit lives in his heart. And so the demon can't cohabit with the Holy Spirit. So if we just lead him to Christ, which we did, and he accepted Christ, which he did, then the demon has to leave, which was brilliant. And I wish I'd know that guy's last name. I wish I could look on Facebook, see if he's still around, and, and find out how he's doing. And then I'll tell you one more little story, a short story. There was a guy down here on Highway 49 years ago. They called him the Foothill Stomper. You might remember him. He made the, the uh, police blotter twice a week, almost getting hit by cars. He'd go out in the middle of traffic, and he'd be beating himself up. I mean... He'd be across Highway 49 from us, and you could hear him hit himself. I mean, he would tater himself. He looked like he had potatoes on him where he hit himself so hard. So one day, I'm, I'm, I'm driving to a church, and uh, this is before I met him. I see him on the side of the road. He's beating himself up. Nobody else is around. And I mean, it's sad, but it was kind of funny. He's beating himself up, and I thought, hey, Lord, that guy's our neighbor. He lives right up here off of Carriage Road. He's our neighbor. I don't even know his name, and I really want to meet him, but I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to stop. I'm going to meet him later because he's busy right now. And so, lo and behold, the very next morning, or no, you know what? I take it back. He's probably about a half a mile, three quarters of a mile from the church when I see him. That morning, later that morning, he comes into the church office. And so, Pastor Tommy and I get to meet him. And so, long story short, we end up several times, me and sound dude Larry, Pastor Tommy, we take him to lunch. We take him to uh, uh, that taco place down there. And then we would take him to In-N-Out. And he, it was fun to be with him because people would just be blown away because they, they would recognize him from Highway 49. And he'd be sitting there talking to us. So anyway, we, we were talking to him one time in the church van. And we're going to lead him to the Lord. I'm thinking, maybe he's demon-possessed. Because he sees people all the time. He's talking to people. He thinks those are other people that are beating him up. So he's delusional. He's seeing things. And so we start talking to him and find out he's saved. His, his mom led him to the Lord years ago. But he's, uh, and, oh, and he opened up his mind to, to demonic beings through methamphetamine. He too was doing like three or four day runs. He did methamphetamine. 
for, for years, opened it, and, and he explained that to us, that he opened up his mind to the occult then. But now, even though he was saved, he was still oppressed by the, by the enemy. He was still hearing voices from the enemy. He said there were times that he could remember that when he read the Bible, he wasn't harassed, but he couldn't see anymore. His, his, he could not see to even sign his name. And so we got him a, a Bible on CD with a little CD player and uh, gave that to him. And we haven't seen him for years. You know, I pray for him once in a while and hope he's doing well. We heard he moved into a, a men's house down in Sacramento. So there's two, two guys. You know, one of them was demon-possessed and, and, and freed. The other guy was demon-possessed and freed, but he was still demon-oppressed. So there's, you know, a lot of things going on there. So here we are. We're going through this, and, and uh, that was the direct attack. That's a direct attack from uh, where the devil just gets inside and possesses somebody. And, and then there's the indirect attack. And that's the most damage. That's where the one that the most damage is done. It's largely through the channels in the world, you know, and ways through the world, through the, you know, through the, into the flesh, into our flesh. So here we are, we're battling the world, we're battling our, our own flesh anyway. But the devil makes his way into our flesh and, you know, attacks us through our flesh, and that's how he makes an attack on people. So the world, as, as human society, is, is blindly and universally, they accept these false values, these shallow ideas and, and insights that are diluted of reality. You know, they're just like way out there, as well as desperately insisting on conforming, they're conforming to their ideas and conforming to their standards. So we have this battle with our flesh, you know, that inward urge toward total independence, toward us being in charge of our own little world, our own little kingdom, right? We're our own little God, and we're going to run our little worlds the way we want to. And, and that's, that's continual, that continual urge is within us, and it's our self-centeredness. It, it's, our, it's our selfishness, okay? And it's driven by our flesh. And it's obviously a universal issue, right? You know, and I'm pretty sure that everybody's uh, experienced this problem. You know, and if you have children, you've witnessed this to be true, okay? Because children, you don't have to train them to scream and, and want their way. Little babies, they're little babies. You don't train them to get all tight and they're screaming because, and with anger and you can tell that they're angry. Nobody trained them that to, to do that. You know, they say, oh, those are cute little babies. I heard one pastor say, are you serious? Those are vipers and diapers. They're not, they're not cute little babies. And, you, and he says, God keeps them little so they don't kill us. And then God does make them cute, probably so we don't kill them. But we don't train them to be little sinners, but they are little sinners in diapers. Okay, so you can see, you can see that we're born into that. We're born into our sinful nature. And, and, and obviously, that this is our flesh. We're born into that sinful nature. And it's the main battlefield. Our flesh is the main battlefield where we fight against these world rulers of present darkness. And, and, it, and the flesh, is that's the arena. That's the most uh, inner arena in us. And you know what? We can't get rid of it. Not on this side of heaven. We take that wherever we go. We can't escape it. We can't run away from it. And because of that, that's where we need to start our battle. That's our starting point for our battle. And it's true, the devil can never totally defeat a Christian, okay? We know that. Those, those who are genuinely, uh, when they genuinely come into a saving relationship with Jesus, then they're delivered from total defeat. You know, we saw that with uh, the Foothill Stomper, okay? He couldn't be totally controlled by Satan. He could be delivered. He was still oppressed, See, the devil can never get us back into the position of the unconscious control which he once held over us. That can't happen. As he, you know, he has that control over the rest of the world. But nothing, the Bible says, can separate us from the love of God. That's what Paul says in Romans chapter 8, right? Nothing can separate us from the love of God. But he can, the devil, he can dishearten Christians, right? He can frighten us. He can make us miserable. He can, he can defeat us in a lot of ways. He can make us weak and unfruitful in the things of God. You know, it's quite possible for at least for a period of time that, that you are, are more unhappy and more miserable as a Christian than you ever were before you were a Christian. 
And so the devil is especially interested in defeating Christians. He wants to beat Christians down. After all, the redeemed world is a problem for the devil. You know, as Jesus put it in Luke eleven twenty one, when a strong man, that's the devil, is, is fully armed, guards his own palace, his, the Satan's palace is the world, his goods, that's the unredeemed people, are safe. Okay, when a strong man, the devil, is fully armed, guards his own world, his goods, the people, are safe. So all the efforts of society to solve the problems in their lives through legislation or education or the change of of environment, they don't bother the devil in the least. He doesn't have to pay attention to them. He's quite content with them to go on rearranging the pieces of the puzzle without solving the puzzle. It's been said... And this is pretty, I mean, this is right on, spot on. And no clever arrangement of selfish hearts is ever going to give us an unselfish world. So you can rearrange it all you want and change the puzzle pieces all around. You're not going to rearrange it into being an unselfish world. Jesus said in Luke eleven twenty two, 22, he says, But when one stronger than he, one stronger than the devil, right, one stronger than this, that strong man, attacks him, they attacks that strong man, overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and, and divides his spoils. So who's the stronger one? It's Jesus. We know that. So he's speaking of himself. And he says, when a strong man, when he's fully armed, when he guards his palace, his goods are safe, and nothing can be done about it, at least of all by the goods themselves, right? So the people aren't going to be able to do anything about it themselves. But when... One who is stronger comes, he breaks down the power of the strong man, and he frees his slaves. So here he declares the second principle, and this is the God factor. That's what we call it, right? He throws in the God factor. Jesus' victory made, made personal to us as individuals, made personal to us through faith, breaks the power of Satan. And, and this is, and here is, the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, it's a mystery of the cross of Jesus and in the power of his resurrection attained by faith that we believe that we individuals, because we have a personal relationship with Jesus, if we've been born into this, into a society which is under the control of, of the mind of Satan. So we're born into this world, but we discover that the force which ruins us and, and, and breaks us is, is it's the power that Jesus has to loose that grip and that we are set free through that resurrection power. And so there's no other power which can do that. That's why the gospel of of Jesus Christ is such an exclusive thing. That's why the path of life is narrow and the path of destruction is wide. That's why Christians are perfectly justified when they say there's no other answer to the problems of humanity. There is no other power which can touch the basic problem of human life. There's, no, there's, no, there's only one. There's only one stronger one who has come to the world and he comes to grips with, with the power of the dark spirit, with the spiritual darkness, and he, and he breaks that power and he frees human life. Okay, remember what Paul uh, told us back in Ephesians 2. This is where he starts it out and he tells us in Ephesians 2, 1. You can follow along for a few verses here. It says, Paul says, and if and you were dead in trespasses and sins. And you and you were dead, not almost dead, thought you were dead, could have been dead. You were dead in trespasses and sins. In which you once walked. And that's past tense. Once walked. You were dead, dead. Now you're alive, because you once walked according to the course of the world following the prince of the power of the air and the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of our body and and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, but God, but God, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the, great, of, of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, 
made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness towards us in Jesus Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of your own doing, it is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast, nobody can boast. For we are of His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That is awesome right there. And he laid that out for us before we even got down to this chapter, because now again, like I said, he's going to break it down for us on the how-to. How does that happen? See, the, the presence of, of every Christian in this world greatly bothers the devil. He hates Christians because each Christian is a potential threat to the solidarity of the devil's kingdom, okay, to his rule over the rest of mankind. So if the devil lets the Spirit of God have his way by individual Christian without exception, whosoever, okay, without exception, whosoever believed, they would, that would be a powerful force to destroy the, the uh, devil's kingdom of darkness. Each Christian would be a door. Each Christian would be a door of escape for, for others out of the unconscious control of the rulers of this present darkness. Every Christian would, 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 would find a way or have a way of, of, uh, of freedom. Each each Christian would, would be a provider of light, dispelling the darkness and, and the ignorance of the world around them. And so the devil can't let that happen. If he can help it, he's not going to let that happen. So he especially and particularly attacks Christians. And so with his minions and all his forces against us, this is what Paul said. I mean, uh, Peter, Apostle Peter says this, 1 Peter 5.8. He says, be sober-minded, be watchful. And I think we went over this first last week. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. And then Paul says this in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond with their deeds. So, like Peter said, sometimes a lion, like Paul says, sometimes an attractive, appealing, offering something that seems right, uh, you know, just the right thing for, the, for just the right moment. The devil takes over in a direct control of a human life whenever and however he can. And most often the devil comes in disguised. He, he comes in disguise through this path into our flesh and makes it like, ooh, that's very enticing. You know, it, he gets to our inner selves with the sweet, subtle, suggestive schemes. And, and that probably is what Paul's warning against. He's particularly right now is the schemes of the devil. In fact, it obviously is because he says that in, in verse 11. He says, put on the whole armor of God that you'll be able to stand against the schemes, the schemes of the devil. So according to the Bible... According to the Bible, the flesh, this in a symbolic sense, is identified with the body which ultimately dies. Check out what Paul says in, in Romans 8, 10, 10, 11. He says, but if Christ is in you, although the body is dead, he tells us it's dead because of sin, okay, the spirit is, is life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. So we get our life through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us, through the, and we have the righteousness of Jesus. And so in this temporary state, before, before the resurrection, the body is the seat of sin, okay? Our flesh is the seat of sin. And, and the evil truth 
of, of self-centeredness is in each, each one of us. And sometimes we think it's dead. It's like, oh yeah, I got over that. And then all of a sudden something will go, oh yeah. And then you're just like, no way. Man, I thought for sure. Nope, not on this side of heaven. It's a sanctification process, okay? We're not going to be sanctified until we're glorified, right? So we're saved sinners on this side of heaven. So we're not going to always be perfect. We're still going to have that flesh. That flesh is still lurking, right? And because of that, the flesh is going to be with us for life. And we're never going to escape it until that wonderful day of the resurrection from the dead. And the body is dead because of sin, is what Paul's told us several times. And so we, we're going to live with that for life. This is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 26. This is awesome. He says, Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? This is pretty appropriate being right after Christmas. Or Christmas, yeah, right. Easter, that's what the, part, the good part about being live. Okay, there is no res- Why? How can you say there is no resurrection from the dead? Verse thirteen. But if there is no resurrection from the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God, and He that He raised Christ, whom He did not. Okay, whom He did did not raise. It, if it is true that the dead are not raised. Okay, he says, okay, well, we testify the fact that that Jesus is raised from the dead, but it's not true if he, in fact, hasn't been raised from the dead, but he has, verse 17, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have no hope, if we have hope in this life only in Christ, if we have hope in this life only, He says, we are of all people most to be pitied. He says, if this is craziness, then I pity the fool. In verse 20, but in fact, fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by man death came, by man has come also the resurrection of, of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ also be made alive. But each in his order, Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. He comes, he then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom of God, the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And then John 10.10, Jesus says, The thief comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have life more abundantly. And so Paul's going to get on. He's going to get on. He's going to talk about putting on the whole armor of God. And we're going to look at at, at what that means, that that God's provided uh, the means for us for that to happen, that we're going to be able to stand in the, in the midst of difficulty. We're going to be able to stand in the midst of darkness. We're going to be able to stand in the midst of craziness and this attack, attack upon us. We're going to be able to overcome. We're going to be li- living victorious and we're going to be unmoved. We're going to be undefeated. And then and only then are we going to be able to take whatever life can throw at us or we're going to be able to handle it. Deuteronomy 31.6 says, Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them that are enemies. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. And that is that's awesome. He, that's a promise. He's never going to leave us, never going to forsake us. Okay, so he's always with us. Even in the craziness that's going on in our, our world right now that we read in the news. And the craziness that's going behind the scenes that we don't even see in the, in the warfare, the spiritual warfare that's going on. He's never going to leave us nor forsake us. Forsake us. He's faithful. And so we're going to go over that, probably not next Sunday, because I think that uh, Pastor Tommy is going to be talking to us about the life of Joseph next Sunday. And that's going to be great, too, because it was Joseph, you know, at the end, where, you know, where he says, uh, 
what God or, or what man meant for evil, God meant for good. And see, so what man meant for evil was that because of the spiritual warfare, you know, because that's demonic. It's demonic what, what his brothers did to him. And so we're going to see this in action in the Old Testament. Pastor Tom's going to break it down for us. And so God bless you guys. Again, it's been a treat to be able to be with you. If you have any questions about anything that I said today, you, uh, be sure and email me or, or text me or call me and uh, we can talk about it. And then uh, stay safe and God bless you guys. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that, that you're God and that you're in control and that we, we can know that. And so I just pray that if there's anybody that watches this and, and, and they don't have a personal individual relationship with, with Jesus, Lord, that they would realize that this is real, this is truth, that Jesus is who he is, that he's alive, that he has risen from the dead, that we serve a risen Savior, and that all of us are sinners and we fall short of the glory of God, and that we can have a relationship with Jesus if, if, uh, if we repent, and that's just to turn from the way we were living and to follow Jesus. And I just pray that if, if somebody makes that decision, that they would, they would call the church and, and we'd be able to talk to them and, and supply them with a Bible and some new believers packets. And so, Lord, as, as, as we go on from this week, we pray that you go before us. Lord, I pray as, as we read your word and do devotionals this week that, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would speak to us personally. Lord, that we would know that we know that, that you're in control, that in, in your providence, Lord, we know that, that you're not going to let anything go to waste. So we pray that we're going to hear a lot of testimonies of people that have given their life to Jesus, that have decided to follow Jesus during this COVID experience that we're going through right now. And so, Lord, I, I, this is just another good thing. There are several good things about sheltering in place. This is another good thing about sheltering in place, that, that there's more people going to be hearing about salvation, about who Jesus is. And so, Lord, I just pray that, that you would draw them to you. And so, again, Lord, I, I'm thankful. I pray you'd wrap your arms around the saints. Lord, that you would love on them. Lord, I pray again that you would just shed your grace on, on this United States of America and give our president and, and those around him uh, wisdom. Lord, I pray that you'd give those scientists wisdom. Lord, I pray I know that you're, that you're in control, so I know that we'll conquer this through, because of your goodness, and we pray for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Uh, see Tommy next Sunday. And I'll see you soon.
Just your 